Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and it is my great honor to be in the Puritan Barn and the Now You See TV, Now You See TV studios with John Pounders once again, bringing you the Midnight Ride. Tonight, we're going to be talking about coming apocalypses, ancient mummies coming to life. And all of this is going to take place on the road to Tartaria. We will be in Tartaria before this midnight ride concludes. So get ready. Here we go. And um, the study tonight is a continuation in the study we did on the last midnight ride I presented uh, the, the on the Dragon Lord's. And in Second Asterisk chapter 15, and in that, we brought forth evidence to the fact that in the last days, there would be an Iranian invasion into Israel, that the Chinese would come to the aid of the Iranians. We talked about the nations of the dragon as it was put forth there in Second Esther 15. Well, we're going to go deeper into that chapter, and we're going to be looking at the spiritual aspect, what is taking place in the spiritual realm while these things are going forth in the physical. And there's just some amazing things that are going to come out in this study tonight. And when I began this study, like John said, I didn't say, well, I'm not going to, I'm just going to sit down and put together a Tartaria lesson, but this is where the evidence took me. So let's get started. And as we look at 2 Estrus 15, Enoch 56, and Daniel 11, there is no doubt in my mind that these three apocalyptic apocalyptic chapters are all talking about the same event, a last day's invasion of Israel by Iran. Now we're going to go deeper and we're going to see a similarity in all three of these chapters that just deeper confirmation of the fact that all three of these chapters are talking about the same event. Let's look in Second Esther 15, beginning in verse 29. When the nations of the dragons of Arabia shall come out with many chariots, and the multitude of them shall be carried as the wind upon the earth, that all they which hear them may fear and tremble. And we identified the nation of China by three definite points of reference in our last midnight ride on the dragon lords. Also the Carminians, which was the province within the ancient Parthian Empire, which is located within the modern country of Iran. Also, the Carmenians, raging in wrath, shall go forth as the wild boars of the wood, and with great power shall they come and join battle with them. And this joining together of China and Iran is going to be a dynamic that we're going to be looking for, the Iranian-China alliance. I believe you're going to see this develop. And join battle with them and shall waste a portion of the land of the Assyrians. Now this would fit in the scenario with Isaiah 17 on Damascus going away from being a city. This will be the flashpoint, as we've said for a long time, of this final World War III. And then shall the dragons have the upper hand. Or when we see Iran and China come together, remembering their nature... And if they shall turn themselves, conspiring together in great power to persecute them, then these shall be troubled. Now, here we're going to see pushback. And in all three of these chapters, 2nd Esther 15, Enoch 56, and Daniel 11, all of them talk about the pushback, that there will be a point in this war when another player enters the game and they're going to be pushed back. And that cannot be coincidental that this is recorded in all three chapters. Let's read it. It says, Then these shall be troubled and keep silence through their power and shall flee. And from the land of the Assyrians shall the enemy besiege them. So someone comes in and uh, and this in the, the obvious character for this to be would be the United States entering the fight 
on behalf of Israel would be the obvious scenario and consume some of them and in their host shall be fear and dread among their kings. Now, in the book of Enoch, chapter 56, we see the same exact scenario. It says, and in those days, the angels shall return and hurl themselves to the east upon the Parthians and Medes. Then the Parthia, uh, the kingdom of Parthia, is in modern-day Iran. They shall stir up the kings so that a spirit of unrest shall come upon them, and they shall rouse them from their thrones, that they may break forth as lions from their lairs and as hungry wolves among their flocks. And they shall go up and tread among the foot, among and tread underfoot the land of his elect ones. And the land of his elect ones shall be before them a threshing floor and a highway. But the city of my righteous, here's the pushback in the book of Enoch. They go and they're just tearing them up. But the city of my righteous shall be a hindrance to their horses, and they shall begin to fight amongst themselves, and their right hand shall be strong against themselves." And a man shall not know his brother, nor a son, his father, or his mother, till there be no number of the corpses through their slaughter, and their punishment be not in vain. Now, let's look at it in the, in the canon from in the Daniel chapter 11. And it talks about the willful king. And this willful king is misidentified in the popular uh, scenarios of modern prophecy teachers and tonight we're going to be showing you some invisible scriptures and we warn you ahead of time you might not be able to see them because these do not fit in with the popular prophetic scenarios and basically there's the pre-wrath scenario and there's the pre-trib scenario and you take the scenario and you take the scriptures and you just put them into the scenario to make everything come out, and whatever doesn't fit in the scenario is just invisible, and you just ignore it. So we're going to be taking some invisible scriptures, and we'll, we'll see if you can see them. I bet you can. But in Daniel 11.36, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. And in the last ride on the, on the dragon lords, we talked about that time of indignation where the wrath was going to be so intense, we are just going to have to duck in cover. Now, in verse 44, we're going to see the pushback. We saw it in Sacronestos 15, the invasion's underway, but then it runs into trouble. We saw it at Enoch, and it's right here in the scripture. It says, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palaces between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. In all three chapters, this invasion from Iran does not end well for the willful king. And here in the scripture, we see him coming to his end in the 45th verse of the 11th chapter of Daniel. Now we get timing. This is this place where we synchronize timing and begin to put these events together. Going on to Daniel 20, 12 and 1, it says, At that time, at the time that the willful king is killed in this invasion into Israel, and at that time shall Michael stand up. This will. This is not only the World War III on earth, but it will be the war in heaven. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found 
written in the book. Now, this is the war that's described in Revelation 12 and 7. Now, behind every truth of Scripture, there's a lie of Satan to cover it up. And many people believe that they're taking the best shot they're ever going to take from Satan, and that's a big porky. The truth is that Satan will be cast back into this realm. The truth is, John 12, 31, at Calvary, he was cast out. Mark chapter tw- or Matthew chapter 12, during the earthly ministry of Christ, he was bound. And in Revelation chapter 12, he's going to be cast back in. This is going to cause people that have bought into the dispensational scenario, many of them will take their own life, and many of them are going to totally apostatize from any kind of a, even a vestige of Christian belief. And there was war in heaven. And this is exactly sequenced in the book of Daniel with this invasion into Israel. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. And remember, it was the dragon, the nations of the dragon lord that's fighting on the earth. And now the dragons of Arabia as Second Estrus put it, and now it's the dragon fighting in heaven. You see, we got a double dragon thing going on. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. Now let's synchronize this with 2nd Estrus 15. And strong winds shall arise from the east and shall open it. And we talked about this in the, in the ride on the dragon lords. And I said, we'll open what? Well, we're going to see just exactly what is opened. And strong winds shall arise from the east and shall open it. And the cloud which he raised up in wrath, and the star stirred to cause fear toward the east and west wind, shall be destroyed. And that star is, I believe, the prince of Persia. He caused all this. He was the dark power over Persia and modern Iran, but he will be destroyed. There is something so nasty coming that it is even going to destroy evil principalities. That's how bad this guy is. In verse 40, it says, The great and mighty clouds shall be puffed up full of wrath, and the star that they may make all the earth afraid and them that dwell therein, and they shall pour out over every high and imminent place a horrible star. Now something is opened. A horrible star comes out and destroys this other star. Well, we're going to positively identify this star. We mentioned it last week, and we're going to positively identify this star in this ride. Now, something was opened. Well, the thing that is opened is right here. We have all of the elements here in Revelation chapter 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, who was the guy that came up uh, that was uh, the big dog daddy? Revelation 9-11, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, half his name, Apollyon. And whether you look at it in the Hebrew or the Greek, Abaddon and Apollyon, they both mean the destroyer. And this is what was referenced in Second Estrus as being opened, this horrible star coming forth, and we're going to see the release of this a horrible star from pagan text, from other confirming text in scripture. And this 
guy is so bad that when he is released, even dark principalities are going to be destroyed. This is going to be the big one right here. Now, here in Isaiah chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, this identifies who the Assyrian is. We talked about other texts, and here again, watch out, this is invisible. You might not be able to see these because they're totally ignored, because it does not fit the popular scenarios. In Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5 through 7, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. In the last ride that I presented on the Dragon Lords, we talked about the indignation. We gave the scriptures that spoke about this period of time that would be precisely five months long. We coordinated the time of the, the sting and the torment of these creatures out of the abyss as being five months, the exact length of time that the waters of the flood covered the earth. So just like Noah was preserved for five months while the flood waters were on the earth, the end time Israel of God will be preserved by the seal of God while these entities are released from the abyss. And it will be the Assyrian, who is the staff of indignation. And the Assyrian is a fallen seraphim that has been used by God as his instrument of wrath when things were so bad that he just had to make a statement. And we're going to see that on the first Passover, that it was the Assyrian that was released that caused the plagues in in the land of Egypt. And also we're going to see tremendous evidence that not only was this destruction felt in the land of Egypt, but that it was felt all over the world. In Exodus chapter 12 and 23, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but that's in the Bible. I hope that's not coming through invisible. It's the destroyer that was there. It's the Assyrian, the destroyer. It's in his heart to destroy. You can see him, and I don't. we don't have the scriptures in this presentation. In Ezekiel 31, you could read verses 3 and verse 16, and it talks about the fall of this Assyrian and his being put within the pit. And he has been brought out at times, of, and when he has come out, it's, it's not just been a little bit bad, it's been real bad. Here's another invisible scripture, 1 Corinthians 10, 9 and 10. This is during the plagues of the wilderness wanderings. According to the scripture, it was the destroyer that caused them. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Revelation 17 and 8. It talks about, we read the scripture in Revelation 9 11, that when the abyss is open, Abaddon, Apollyon, the destroyer, will come out. Revelation 17 and 8. There's a scripture here that is true of the Assyrian, it is also true of Satan. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And this is a specific reference to the destroyer, and his role that's going to be played the same destroyer that brought the plagues on the first Passover, he will also bring the plagues on the last Passover. I thank God that we've got through this Passover and uh, things are a little rocky, but 
the heavenly luminaries are still in place. Next year, we don't know. Did you have anything you wanted to say, John, before we... Oh, man, I mean, golly, David, that's all that stuff right there is just pretty amazing how the way it's it's put together there. I mean, there's no doubt. And when you look at the destroyer, you know, that's such an interesting topic. Of course, you have all over the world in, in mythology, you have this destroyer, uh, even the Vedic and the Hindu texts, right? You have this destroyer, which is featured out at CERN. You have these... This idea, and, and we were, we were, I know you're going to get into some of this, but, you know, we've been uh, studying um, as deep as we can into some of the astronomical events that have taken place in the world. And when we start talking about this destroyer, obviously millions of, uh, well, millions of things, something major comes to mind, but a, a lot of different clues on uh, what a lot of mythologies talk about. I mean, almost all of them have this star this star or, or thing or whatever you want to call it that comes forth and creates a, a crash truck event that really actually changes and you'll get into that but changes yeah. time itself yeah it changes time itself it changes the calendar and uh, we're going to be looking at the destroyer from egyptian text we're going to be getting the egyptian version of the plagues of exodus which is uh, really quite phenomenal now when when this war begins also the war in the heavenlies will take place and we're going to look at a text here in second exodus and we're going to look behind the scenes into the spiritual realm for just a moment in second exodus 1535 and they shall smite one upon another, and they shall smite down a great multitude of stars upon the earth, and even their own star, and blood shall be from the sword unto the belly. Now, this talks about casualties in the angelic realm of stars being beat down to the earth by other stars, this is literally an angel war that we're seeing, and the war in heaven, this is going to be wild, and I don't know how much of this we're going to see during this time, the, the word in Isaiah says, you know, you better get in and hide, because there's going to be all kinds of strange going on, this is when Jesus said, men's hearts are going to fail them for fear. Their hearts are just going to give out because it's just too much for them. Now, there is a precise correlation to this in the scripture about the smiting down of the stars. Now, let's read it in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 10. Now, there's another definite pattern in scripture that is totally missed once again because it does not fit the popular prophetic scenarios. But it's very simple. It's so simple and plain, nobody needs to miss it. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, there is a little horn that comes up out of the sea. In Daniel chapter 8, there's a little horn that comes up across the earth. One out of the sea, Daniel 7. One out of the earth, Daniel 8. In Revelation 13... There are two beasts spoken of. The first beast comes up out of the sea. The second beast, the false prophet, comes up out of the earth. Very clear, very straightforward pattern. Rebel Daniel 7 is prophesying about the first beast in Revelation 13. Daniel chapter 8 is prophesying about the second. So with that in mind, and this will be the false prophet who will be one of the popes. Now, let's read Daniel 8 and 10. It says, And speaking of the little horn, And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground. This is exactly what was spoken in Estrus chapter 15 verse 35, that there's going to be casualties in this spiritual war. We're actually going to have angels fighting and destroying one another, casting them to the ground and stamping them. And in this text, it says that the little horn will do this. And this is actually going to be accomplished through satanic rituals, I believe done right in the Vatican, and through science falsely so-called actually being used, CERN-type technology, to actually open up gates to bring these 
uh, entities through. Let's read it again. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. You know, uh, one thing that brings that comes to mind when you're talking about the blood in, in Second Estrus 1535 being up to the, I believe it said the swords and to the belly, you know, obviously in my head I'm thinking Revelation uh, chapter 20 uh, in verse 19 and 2019 talks about the Antichrist, which you can you can sum up the number of the Antichrist, right, 666. And then you have, right after that, you have this reaper, this angel reaper of sorts that first the, the Almighty comes out with um, a sickle and then another angel, it says in verse 19 to 20, it says, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it in the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city and the blood came out of the winepress even into the horse bridles by the space of thousand and six hundred furlongs. And it just reminds me of that whether it has any correlation, I'm not 100%, but it definitely, um, you know, if you continue going on with that stuff, it talks about the seven angels, the seven plagues, all of these different things that are going on at the same time. Obviously, mass chaos, that's one common thing they hold, but the blood being at a level like that, that is, um, that's that's the only place I see that. And if you think about blood being up to the belly, that's about to, you know, depending on what kind of horses they had, that would be close to the horse's yeah. bridle. You know, at least for somebody my size. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of blood. It's going to be so bad, we don't even want to go out during this time. Yeah. We better be ready to stay in because you go out, you're going to die. Yeah. Now, I'm going to give some credence to the fact that the actual bringing in, just like Crowley, he brought the entity Iwas in through the door in a ritual in the early part of the 20th century. And this is going to be that on steroids, where they actually, through the the science of CERN and through satanic rituals, actually bring these entities through the gate, and it's going to be war. And evidently, uh, because they found some of these more to their liking than the others, there's even a complete rearrangement of the satanic structure. But anyway, I'm going to give a little credence to the fact that that could be very likely. This is a book that was written by a Catholic priest, Montague Summers. And this book is entitled The History of Witchcraft and Satanism. And in this book, there's something that I want to read you. And bear in mind that this fellow here was a Catholic priest. And it says here on page uh, 152, he tells the story of the discovery of a satanic ritual chamber in Rome. He says, in May 1985, at the Bourget family visited the Palazzo Bourget, and they, this guy wanted to show off a little, I guess. You know how guys are, but he married uh, uh, his new bride, and he wanted to take her to the family palace here and kind of show off a little bit. And he wanted to get the people out that were living in this place. And there was this one tenant that was hard to get out. And he had to get the police in to get him out. But when they finally got this guy out of there, it was kind of interesting uh, what they found. And here's the record of what was found. It says, when the keys had been produced, the cause of the reluctance was soon plain. The room within was inscribed with the words Templum, Palaticum. The walls were hung all around from ceiling to floor with heavy curtains of silk damask, scarlet and black excluding the light. At the further end there stretched a large tapestry upon which was woven in more than life size a figure of Lucifer, colossal triumphant dominating the whole. Exactly beneath the altar had been built amply furnished for the liturgy of hell, candles, vessels, rituals, missal, nothing was lacking. Cursions, cushioned pre and luxurious chairs, crimson and gold, were set in order for the assistance. The chamber being lit by electricity, fantastically arrayed so as to glare from an enormous human 
eye. There was a ritual book found there, and the ritual was summoning three entities, Ashtaroth, Asmodeus, and Lucifer. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about Asmodeus. Now, in the demonic realm, and well, let's look at this next slide, John, and uh, we'll see the picture here of the Palazzo Bourget. And I'm just saying, this is not Motel 6. The Bourget is one of the crazy rich, elite European families. And, uh, you know, this is not Motel 6. They did not find Tom Bodette in there. This was an absolute elite ritual chamber where the absolute elites worship the devil. And in the satanic ritual book found in that chamber, there were the three entities that were summoned. Now, in the demonic pecking order, Asmodeus is the demon directly under the destroyer. Abaddon, Apollyon, the Assyrian. Now, let's just ask ourselves the question. And one of the greatest black magicians of all time, Eliphas Levi, he was a Catholic priest that went wrong. Now, would a Catholic, and you see, they, they was having a little trouble summoning the destroyer. He was doing a little time in the pit at that time. But would a Catholic priest gone wrong know that Asmodeus was the devil directly under the destroyer in the demonic pecking order. Now, they absolutely would. I want to read an amazing entry for you from this book. This is the Catholic Encyclopedia published in 1910. This is a huge thing. It's 16 volumes. It's the largest material ever put out by the Catholic Church concerning their doctrine and history. And I want to read the entry. This is so big, it's kind of awkward. I'll get it open here. I'll fix your mic for you, David. It's flopping all over the place. All righty, I'm, I'm a wiggling trying to get my book here. But this is a big boy. But this is the entry in this Catholic encyclopedia on Asmodeus. The name of the demon mentioned in the book of Tobias 3.8, the name most probably derived from the Hebrew root to destroy, so that the being would correspond to the demon called Abaddon the Destroyer in the Apocalypse, Revelation 9.11. Yes, they absolutely would know that, wouldn't they? And this is the kind of ritual work done right in Rome and even right in the Vatican that we're talking about that is going to bring these entities through and the war in heaven is going to be part angelic, part human, and all bad. Now, in this book, there's more confirmation of this in this book called Keys of This Blood. And this was written by Malachi Martin, who was a Vatican insider, and I'll just read a little snippet from this. Uh, on page 632 of Keys of This Blood, it says, At the beginning of Pope Paul's sixth reign in 1963, indeed Paul had alluded somberly to the smoke of Satan, which had entered the sanctuary, an oblique reference to an enthronement ceremony by Satanists in the Vatican. Besides, the incidence of satanic pedophilia, rites and practices was already documented among certain bishops, as priests as widely dispersed at turn in Italy and South Carolina in the United States. The cultic acts of satanic pedophilia are considered by professionals to be the culmination of the fallen angels' rights. Everybody is unfortunately well aware of the tremendous pedophilia, uh, sex abuse in Catholicism. It becomes so widespread that there was just no keeping a lid on it. And this is seen as the consummation of the rites of the fallen angels, of the sacrifice of blood and sex that has got to be there to open this door for the final entry of these entities. Now, one more interesting piece of information here that helps to give us a picture to see that this is 
definitely a most likely scenario. We have here a picture of the book Exo Vaticana. And Tom Horn and Chris Putnam did a great job bringing to a lot of people's knowledge the fact that the Vatican was the possessor of this Lucifer telescope out in Arizona. It's totally run by the Jesuits. And I'll just read a little bit uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with this. On page nine of this book, it says Lucifer, which stands for Large Binocular Telescope, Near Infrared Utility with Camera and Integral Field Unit for Extragalactic Research is a chilled instrument attached to a telescope in Arizona. The LBT, the Large Binocular Telescope, currently one of the world's most advanced optical telescopes where, among other things, the new Lucifer device is attached between its gigantic twin mirrors either of which would be the largest optical telescope in continental North America. And it just gets worse and worse. They're, this is totally run by the Jesuits. They talk not only about wanting to contact these entities, but they even talk about baptizing them when they show up. Well, there are people that are going to help them to show up. And this is something that is described in Daniel 8, Estrus 15, that is going to be, um, it's going to literally be hell on earth. And that's not just a metaphor. Now, we're going to look at, uh, well, this is Luke twenty one twenty five, And Jesus said, there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. The next thing he said that men's hearts will be failing them for fear. Now, I want to read some things here out of the Egyptian text and then we're going to get on the road to Tartaria. Now, I want to read from the Colburn Bible, and this Colburn Bible is Egyptian text, and it gives the story of the Exodus from the Egyptian perspective. And they claim that the Exodus was caused by, guess who? Yes, the destroyer. And they not only said that it was caused by the destroyer, but that the destroyer was coming back. This is also something that we could show you in scripture. We've looked at this text before in the 14th chapter of Isaiah about the return of the destroyer. But I'll just read a little bit, and this is not a godly text. This is a pagan text, but it's tremendously confirming, and it shows that the story from their perspective. It says, and this is on page 234, it says, men forget the days of the destroyer. Only the wise know where it went and what it will return and that it will return in its appointed hour. It raged across the heavens in the days of wrath, and this was its likeness. It was as a billowing cloud of smoke enwrapped in a ruddy glow, not distinguishable in joint or limb. Its mouth was an abyss from which came flame, smoke, and hot cinders. When blood drops upon the earth, the destroyer will appear, and mountains will open up and belch forth fire and ashes. Trees will be destroyed and all living things engulfed. Waters will be swallowed up by the land, and seas will boil. Thus it was in the days of heavenly wrath which have gone, and thus it will be in the days of doom, when it comes again. O sentinels of the universe who watch for the destroyer, how long will your enduring vigil last? O mortal men who wait without understanding, where will you hide yourselves in the dread days of doom when the heavens shall be torn apart and skies rent in twain in the days when children turn gray 
headed. The doom shape called the destroyer in Egypt. The doom shape is like a circling ball of flame. These are things said of the destroyer in the old records. Read them with solemn heart, knowing that the doom shape has its appointed time and will return. And it goes on and on, and it talks about the plagues in Egypt being caused by this destroyer, just like the Bible does. And it describes it as an entity that is much like a heavenly luminary coming back into the earth. And this is exactly the things that we were talking about of the heavenly luminaries going astray uh, when we talked about our midnight ride on the dragon lords. Now, I want to read one thing here from Emanuel Velikowski, and you just can't make this stuff up. But the emperor in China at the time of the Exodus was named Yahua, Y-A-H-O-U. And this, according to Velikowski, who was Jewish, said, and he spoke the language, he said that this was a form of the divine name. And it talks about the disasters taking place, not just in Egypt, but also in China. And it says that at the time of these disasters in China, that time was actually changed, and that this emperor sent his astronomers out all over the land of Egypt so that they could determine and calculate again the length of the day and the month and the year. And it says here, I'll just read you a little bit, this is on page 104 of Worlds in Collision by Emmanuel Velikowski. It says, in the days of Yahuwah, the four quarters of the heaven were established anew, and observations of the duration of the year and month and of the order of the seasons were made. The history of China in the period before this catastrophe is quite obliterated. All these data are in accord with the traditions of the Jewish people about the events connected with the Exodus. As we shall see, the Hebrew sources to reveal that a new calendar was established reckoning from the days of the catastrophe and that the seasons and the four quarters of the heaven were no longer the same. Now that is just absolutely phenomenal to me. And there is, and this is, goes right in line with the show John did last week on the calendar that there is some compelling evidence from traditions of the Maya, the American Indians, that there was a change in time itself at the time of the period of the Exodus. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because obviously the, the calendar show we did last week, this definitely strikes my interest, but, you know, you have obviously the 360-day the calendar of the Babylonians, which basically most people probably don't know this, but it was adopted by the Hebrews. It's the same calendar as this lunar solar calendar where they had to have a month inter intercalendary month in order to keep up with the seasons, this this actually goes back, and actually the original name for the month, um, I can't remember the name right now, but you guys can look it up. It's actually in Second Mac Maccabees. The first month of the year is named after an older calendar that takes its calendar from the Babylonian calendar. So it's interesting. And then you have, and in the, in the Babylonians weren't dummies. There's no doubt about that. They were not. They weren't stupid. That you know, these are the people that found the star that held in. The Messiah, right? They, there's some of the people that would be considered Chaldeans, people that would have, been, would have been in the court of the king at the time, would have figured out the star pass. So there had to be something. I mean, you know, when you have Book of Enoch mentioning 364 days, you have the Jews that sell, do the do the new moon but have to add a month every year. You have all of these calendars. Even, even our own Gregorian calendar, which is actually a really decent calendar, you have to add a leap year every four years in order to keep up with the season. So something... There's no even number there, which is hard to it's hard to imagine no even number there. But anyways, it's interesting, and this cataclysm is definitely one of the only. Um, you're getting ready to read another source for it, but there's sources for this event that give us at least an understanding or outlook that is possible. Because other than that, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is something that makes much more sense of it than. Uh, anything I've heard before trying to reconcile all of that. And 
the the picture we get from scripture and the picture that is corroborated by sources all over the world is that at the time of the Exodus, there was, and this is Syrian, when he was brought out to be the destroyer and God's indignation on Egypt, that it was literally, he was a star, that he was either in the shape of a star himself or a, an angel pushing a star, and he was a seraphim, just exactly how it was, we don't know, but there are records all over the world of the disruption in the heavens and of a just disasters all over the world. And uh, there we could just go on and on and on with corroborating statements, just like in the Colburn Bible, and uh, on and on. But anyway, let's go on the road to Tartaria. Let's go to Tartaria. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 39... Let's begin in verse 11. And this is a text that I believe Nolan asked a question about. And I passed on that question because I said I was looking into it and was going to have something to say about it. Well, we're going to say a little something about it. Uh, beginning in verse 11, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. The Valley of the Passengers. Now, this word passenger is what we're going to key on and look at. And it shall stop the noses of the passengers, and there they shall bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the Valley of Hamon Gog. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying them, that they may cleanse the land. Yea, all the people of the land shall bury them, and it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, saith the Lord God. And they shall sever out men of continual employment, passing through the land to bury with the passengers. Now, it's interesting here that the people in Israel will cooperate with these passengers. There's two groups of people. There's the people in Israel plus these passengers that are working together burying these things. It says, And they shall sever out men of continual employment, passing through the land to bury with the passengers those that remain upon the face of the earth to cleanse it. After the end of seven months shall they search, and the passengers that pass through the land, when any man seeth a man's bone, there shall be set up a sign by it till the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamon Gog. Now, what in the world is it talking about? Well, I did a lot of looking into this word passenger, and uh, I will share with you what I found. And I believe, and you see these passengers in the text are distinguished from the humans living in Israel at that time, and I believe that these passengers are maybe part human, but certainly more than human. I believe this could be the final destination of the genetically altered transhuman human race. And let's just look at this word passenger, and I'm going to go to two very credible Hebrew sources. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is Jacinius's Hebrew lexicon. And this is what it means. It means to pass over. And literally, the word abar means to pass from one place to another. And I think quite possibly these are entities that have passed from that realm when the pit was opened and they have passed into this realm, they have passed over. It means to depart and die. It means to pass away or to depart. It, mean, it says a female is said to let pass, to conceive, and hence to become pregnant. To cause, to pass over, to transmit, to send over. To cause to remove from one place to another, from one city to another, he made them exchange habitations. Now that word habitation is interesting because in Jude, the sixth verse, it says that the angels left 
their habitation. And in 2 Corinthians 5 and 1, that same Greek word is used of the glorified bodies of believers. The habitation is the body. And a passenger is somebody that rides in something else, isn't it? And I believe that these passengers are human or part human that have been genetically altered or possessed and we don't know exactly what but they have been become the habitation and literally these entities have become passengers in their bodies now we'll look at another very credible hebrew source here and you can just file this under you can't make this stuff up this is the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, and it's the absolute top of the food chain for getting information on Hebrew words. It tells you everything, and it even tells how the Egyptian equivalent of this Hebrew word abar is used in Egyptian writings. And this is what it says. It says, uh, most of the occurrences are found in the so-called books of the underworld, mortuary literature, the book of gates, litany of the sun, which guided the deceased to his or her goal, becoming one with Osiris. The secular nocturnal course of the sun is significant for the bodies of the deceased and for all the creatures of the underworld when the light of the shining sun reaches the rigid mummies in their crypts they are awakened and filled with breath so this word passenger is used by the egyptians for the bringing to life of mummies to pass over from that realm to this and come back to life you can't make that stuff up. I mean, it's right here yeah. in the most credible source you could find of information on that Hebrew word. I mean, that just absolutely melts my wires. What can you say? So I think we've got every reason to believe that these passengers in Ezekiel chapter 39, this could be the final destination of those that go along with the global program of the genetic corruption of the human genome. And uh, David, I'm going to hold what I have to say till after you present these next slides because I think it will go better after them um, from what I have to say. So go ahead. Okay. Now, these are pictures of the mummies of Tartaria. And this is the picture of a Tartarian queen. And... Uh, even in, uh, it, they, she was called the beautiful queen because even in death, uh, or her, the beauty of her features were shown and uh, part of her, uh, the reconstruction there of this, uh, this mummy. And it's interesting, and there were mummies found, they're called the Tartarian mummies, and to the south of it, in the foothills of the Himalayas, there were more mummies that were found, and these were huge. Uh, even the women were over six foot tall in these mummies that were just to the south of these Tartarian mummies. And some of these Tartarian mummies here were red-headed. Uh, they were Caucasian. And this is now in a province in the Ying Chang province in China, I believe, and they have absolutely shut down any entry or study because this disproves not only the Chinese history, but the history of the entire world that these people are Caucasian, that these Caucasians, there is tremendous evidence that in Tartaria, that it was the basis not only of the Sumerian uh, of civilization, but also the basis of the Egyptian. It's always been a mystery because the oldest pyramids were the most advanced. They started out with the most advanced and they got less intricate as they went on. Well, you'd think they would start out less advanced and get better, but that's not the way it was. And it's always been a mystery. Where did the Egyptians get their culture? Perhaps we have an answer it could have come from the Tartarians. And we're going to give some 
absolute credible facts why that could be. And another one of the interesting things about these mummies, they were tattooed. The, these mummies had places where they had had operations performed on them. Uh, they were very advanced in their knowledge. And these mummies were made exactly like Egyptian mummies. The hair was still on the head, the brains were removed, and the eternal organs removed. The exact same process that was followed by the Egyptians precisely. And it's no wonder why we read in the Word of God in Leviticus 19.28, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. This is a pagan practice that the Lord doesn't approve of. And if you have a tattoo, you might not be able to afford to take it off, but you can repent. And what we do when we minister to people, we will pray for tattoos. We'll anoint them with oil. And Donna will anoint the ladies. And we will break of uh, the attachments to those tattoos. It's a fact. Uh, we've read papers before on the ride where the ink in tattoos can actually cause genetic corruption. And it's also a fact that some of the, the patents for tattoo ink, many of the biggest and most popular are held by Satanists. So that's not something uh, that you want to do. So, so David, since you said that, now I'll, I'll say what okay, I was going to say ahead, because I want to I want to add this in because what you were saying earlier about the passengers, Tartaria, as as a lot of you guys know, I did a show about Tartaria. What was that about a year year or so ago, probably right? Maybe a year or two ago. And yeah. in in that show, I remember doing the research, and I remember uh, seeing a a direct tie with Tartaria and Vikings, which was interesting. Yeah. Now, when you look at when you think about that for you know in in Viking mythology or Odinism, uh, whatever you want to call it, you have these things in, in there that, that basically. I just want to read this real quick. It says, um, in basically in Ragnarok, you have these that what they call Norse giants. They're Norse giants, and they're also called Skinwalkers and White Walkers. And it has to do with like the frost giants and stuff like that. But every every year they would, and, and it's it represented in the movie Game of Thrones. But every year they would come forth like zombies, almost. They were like you know not even alive, you know, type beings, and they would come through. And they had this huge wall, a massive wall that they held to. And obviously, when you think of that, you think of the Great Wall of China, right? You think of this wall that literally spans further than from North America up towards Alaska down to South America. This massive wall, huge undertaking. Donald Trump spent billions and millions of dollars and many man hours trying to build a wall on the border. Uh, no can do, but these guys built a wall that was thousands of miles long across all of China for some reason to hold something back. And you see this kind of stuff in, in Viking literature. You're talking about these people being Aryan or white you, this is this this fits in almost perfectly with that, and some people are probably listening tonight. David saying, "So what the heck is Tartaria? I have never heard of that in my life. They didn't teach me that in school. They didn't tell me anything about Tartaria, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But cover ups are one of them. We can talk about that later. But I just wanted to throw that out there because I thought it was super interesting um, to point that out. And obviously, we know that um, the people, the Odin Odinistic people, the Vikings, they join forces. Uh, very strongly with some of these ring lord families that we're talking about tonight. So that's interesting to note. I just want to note that before we get going. And there are a couple other shows we've done uh, on Tartaria on the Midnight Ride, probably two or three of them. Right. And this is most definitely a tremendously uh, fascinating subject. And just to give a little background of understanding about Tartaria, do you want to uh, play that clip from that other ride where you have that CIA, CIA document? Yeah, I've got the was a I've, deliberate cover up. Yeah, I've actually got the, the document right here and I'll just read it because that's basically what that clip is. You can find that clip on the Midnight Ride YouTube channel uh, because I did document that. So I'd have it, you know, in my in my resources to see. So um, this is from a CIA docket. This is uh, National Cultural Development Under Communism. And I'm, it's a little bit blurry. I'm going to have trouble reading it here. But it was approved for release in 1999. Um, so let me, let me just read this. It says, 
Or let us take the matter of history, which along with religion, language, and literature constitute the core of people's cultural heritage. Here again, the communists have interfered in a shameless manner. For example, on, on 9th of August, 1944, the Central Committee of the Communist Party, sitting in Moscow, issued a directive ordering the party's Tartar Provincial Committee to proceed to a scientific revision of the history of Tartaria to liquidate serious shortcomings and mistakes of a nationalistic character committed by individual writers and historians in dealing with Tartar history. In other words, Tartar history was to be rewritten, uh, let us be frank, let us be frank, was to be falsified in order to eliminate references to great Russian aggression and to hide the facts of the real course of Tartar-Russian relations. And, and as I said, you guys can go check that out for yourself. But that is a CIA document released in 1999, I believe is what the date it says, and it's called Natural Cultural Development Under Communism. Uh, interesting thing to note. That's why, and I, because when I heard of it and somebody, and my friend Rick was like, you got to check this stuff out. I'm like, I mean, I studied history. That was one of my majors, one of my favorite things to study. I never heard of Tartaria. Why is that that I'm never, like, this can't be real. And then I go to this this uh, bed Airbnb that I'm staying after I get done with the conference. And what do I see in the room? This big map of Tartaria in the room. And I'm like, why have I never heard this before? Anyways, I, I digress. I'll let you go. Well, it's amazing. And there's a definitely, it's documented that human beings are wanting to cover up the knowledge of Tartaria. And I think it's quite likely because they know it is the basis not only of the Sumerian but of the Egyptian religion uh, and civilization and perhaps even Isaiah 14.20 which talks about the kingdom of Lucifer. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Mm. Perhaps Tartaria was the original kingdom of Lucifer. And um, I think it's something that is indeed quite possible. Now, let's look at some more compelling evidence that uh, the Tartarians could indeed have been the basis of the Sumerian religion, which is... Uh, the history books will tell you that that's the oldest, and then the Egyptian. But let's just read a little bit. This is a book called The Realm of the Ring Lords, and we featured the writings of Lawrence Gardner uh, on several midnight rides. This guy knew way too much about way too many things. He was a high-ranking British Freemason that was, uh, he had access to the elite private libraries in Europe and also to the elite Masonic libraries that your average fellow just can't get into. But he has been saying way too much about way too many things. And he talks about Tartaria. And I'm going to begin on page 68 in the Realm of the Ring Lords. And I'm just going to read a few things he says about uh, Tartaria and the Tartarian mummies. And he puts forth some evidence here that is extremely compelling. But he says, uh, Tartaria, which sits on the Marls River, 70 miles south of Transylvania, the city of Cluj. It says... The truly important fact about this region is that its culture was that of the Scythian woodlords, the Transylvania fairy race that spawned the Tuladoth de Anu king tribe. This connects directly to the folklore of the Druids and according to the people that believe in the bloodline that comes down from the, the line through the goddess, through uh, through Lilith, and who is the queen of the the, the bloodline. Uh, this is a huge thing. And according to him, it comes from this area in Tartaria. It says the people of the Tartarian region were the prognators of many aspects of the emergent Sumerian culture. And he talks about the language that was found at the Sumerian city of Enki. He says these Enki graphics each have their equivalents on the Tartaria tablets. Now, John, do you have that slide of the Tartaria tablets? Yes, sir, I do. Here we go. 
And this is this is something amazing. This is ancient, man. This is so. I remember seeing this when I first found it and thinking, "Is how can this be possible?" And of course, I didn't couldn't put anything together with it. I thought honestly, I thought this subject was kind of done until David comes into the office uh, the other day and look, he's like, "I think I found out that Tartaria is older than Egypt." I'm like, "What?" You know, it's just amazing to me. Like, you know, this is just mind blowing because. I, I don't know how else to say it, David. I mean, when I think about, you know, how much I really have st- thought I knew about history and studied history, and then these just these last couple of years have just really shown me how, how little that I do know and how little that really most people know about it. And, and what we're finding out is is there's a reason we're finding stuff out, just yeah. like there was a reason that these these uh, fragments were found in this cave. You know, do you know what was found in the cave of the fragments? Did you ever did you see that mm-hmm. they found these fragments just the other day in the cave? And there, were, I'm not going to go very long into it, but there were two scriptures uh, in the in the Bible that were found in these scriptures. And I'll tell you about them later if we have time, because if you read those scriptures, it's like is God trying to tell us something right now? Because it's Nahum is one of them, and the other one is in Zechariah. And both of them are just so significant for this time. But finding this kind of history for this time is significant as well, in my opinion, very significant. Yeah. So, you know, we got to, and you know, it's aggravating. And this is like an awakening moment. And a lot of people haven't had this awakening moment. They want to believe what their churches tell them. They want to believe what the educational institutions are telling them and what their government is telling them. Hardy har har on that one. But we have been lied to. We have been lied to. And it's an awakening when you realize that we have been lied to big time. And if this is true, and it's a fact, it's a fact that these Tartaria tablets have direct equivalents in the Sumerian language found at Enki. And if that be the case, everything that we're being told about ancient history is a lie and a spin, quite likely to cover up the original kingdom of Lucifer, which was indeed Tartaria, which will absolutely destroy the lies that these governments are telling the people about their histories. Now, going on. Speaking of destroying lies about history, this next guy you're going to talk about here in a minute, man. Wow. Yeah. Um Let's see. Now, read a couple more things. It says, going on in Gardner, it says of of particular importance when tracing the South movement of the Scythians. These Scythians were travelers. They were migrators. They moved. And uh, that's another real correlation to the, the Ezekiel passage of the passengers of particular importance when tracing the southward movement of the Scythians. And this is the area that Josephus says was the area of Gog and Magog. And this was the area of the Caucasian mountains where the word Caucasian comes from. Uh, The movement of the Scythians into Mesopotamia is the fact that these mighty warlords of the transcendent Sid were also called the Sumare, which, as we have seen, was an old Gallic word for a coiled serpent. It is therefore perhaps not surprising that their Sumerian fairy language was the root of the later dubbed Sumerian tongue. The main settlement of the god Anu, and this is the the god that was worshipped by the Sumerians as the sky god, the main settlement of the sky god Anu was not in Sumer, where one might expect to find it, but hundreds of miles to the north on the Caspian Sea. During a migration route from the Black Sea down into the Delta Plains of the Sumerian Eden, they were the travelers. Going on, just a couple more things. It says, and he talks about the Tartarian mummies. He said, the Althi Mountains between Siberia and Mongolia, they're preserved by the severe cold since the distant B.C. years. And they even date these, the um, 
the secular historians say they're at least 1,800 years old, and I think they better back that up a little. But anyway, uh, was found a Scythian burial mound, a Kurgan, where bodies of ancient chieftains together with their horses, clothing, and possessions had all been remarkably preserved from decay. We showed you some slides of those. And uh, the mummification... Uh, exact same process as that which was later used in Egypt. Um, one more thing here. It says uh, on page 74, he says, like the Tartaria mummies, and this is talking, he's speaking of the mummies that were found to the south of the Tartarian mummies in the foothills of the Himalayas. And he says, like the Tartaria mummies, they are of impressive stock with light skin, auburn hair, and pale eyes, the leather and woolen clad men stood at least six foot six, and upwards, even the women were over six foot tall. They were big folks, big folks, and I think we all know why that they were. So this is just absolutely amazing that we wind up here on the road to Tartaria, and this could actually be speaking to us of the final destination of the human race. And in this slide, I read you one snippet here from Emanuel Velikowski, Words, Worlds in Collision, and I could read over and over quotes from the Mayas, the Incas, the American Indians, the Chinese, all over the world that speak of a reset of the calendar and of global cataclysms during the time of the Exodus. It's absolutely amazing. So it looks like the return of the destroyer that it is going to make for some memorable Passover in the future. I do believe that that is the fact. Now, let's shift into the future just a little bit. And we're going to go back to Second Estrus chapter 15. We're going to pick up the text here. And we're going to tie in the thought that we did on our last midnight ride on the Dragon Lords where we identified China as the, the dragon nation from the east that was going to join with the Iranians. And, I mean, this is just obvious. I mean, this is just obvious from what the, the present geopolitical situation. But let's read some text here. Uh, in Second Estrus 15, and they shall go steadfastly unto Babylon and make her afraid. They shall come to her and besiege her. The star and all wrath shall they pour upon her. Then shall the dust and smoke go up into the heaven, and all they that be about her shall bewail her, and they that remain under her shall do service unto them that have put her in fear. And thou, Asia, thou art partaker of the hope of Babylon, and art the glory of her person. It prophesies that Asia will conquer and become the glory of Babylon. Now, what city is being spoken of here? At the time this was written, the city of Babylon had ceased to exist, as it has in this day. But let's look at some things. And this language in Second Estrus, it has specific references to the book of Revelation and also to the book of Ezekiel. Now let's look at some of them. In Revelation 18 and 2, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And direct reference here in uh, to the, the language in Estrus, and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning in revelation 19 verses 1 through 3 and after these things i heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying alleluia salvation and glory and honor and power unto the lord our god for true and righteous are his judgments for he hath judged the great whore 
which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. Now, what city are we talking about? Now, this would fit very specifically two cities very well. One would be Rome, and one would be New York City. And I believe it's very possible that both of these cities are going to be taken out. I believe it's very possible that New York City is going to be devastated and that the final seat of world government is going to go back to Jerusalem. Now, Babylon, the great city, it has changed. Babylon was gone at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, but Revelation seventeen eighteen it says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth present tense over the kings of the earth. 98 AD, there's no doubt that was Rome. Now let's look. It talks here about the great city. The Re book of Revelation also tells us that there is going to be another great city in the last days. In Revelation 11, 8, which is the chapter about the two witnesses, it says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. I believe the final great city, the final Babylon, if you will, could very well be Jerusalem after Rome and New York City is taken out. But the big takeaway for us, we need to get our spiritual house and our physical house in order. As we celebrate the Passover, and as we go into the Feast of Unleavened Bread, as we fast from yeast, and we partake of the unleavened bread, reminding us that we were once a slave to sin, and a slave in the nation of Egypt and the bondage of sin. We remember that first Passover, and it was only because of the plagues that Pharaoh finally let his people go. We are again in bondage. The people of God are being put in bondage by our modern day Pharaohs, but he will let us go also. And these plagues that will cause many to, to just die from the sheer horror of what's coming. On the Passover, I believe very soon, we're going to see the destroyer come back once again. And we're going to see the plagues come back and the judgment of God. God's indignation will be poured out. And once again, Pharaoh will let his people go.